don't forget, I paid a lot of dues up front. I was going to police academy at 4.30 in the morning when all my friends were coming back from Rutgers. Shit face, talking about hooking up with chicks. This is gonna hurt. It's time, it's time for, the for the Suffering Podcast. podcast. Our life focus goes in a direction that we best see as matching our ambition. We have an idealistic, unreal reality, painting a roadmap to where we're supposed to be, only seeing the grim finish below the glossy veneer once we're inside. Life takes an unexpected turn, and we're forced to change our perspective. This change allows the opening of new doors and fixing what you might have seen as broken, shedding the tunnel vision and creating opportunity that replaces frustration. Now, with clear eyes, we can emerge to do what we're meant to do. Our life's calling yells in our deaf ears until we're ready to hear it. Where you end is not where you begin, but where you are is where you belong. I'm Kevin Donaldson here with Mike Felice, and on this episode of The Suffering Podcast, we welcome Dennis Benigno. I hope I said that right. See, Close it, enough. It's it's the it's the, <laughs> it's the, the Italian. Vowel. It ends in everything that yeah. ends in a vowel. You you always grew up. And on this episode of the Suffering Podcast, we sit down with Dennis to discuss the suffering of street cop training. Dennis is providing a much needed asset to our law enforcement community. Thank you so much for coming in. I appreciate it, man. Thanks for having me. Could travel all this way from East Windsor, right? It's oh, a hike, man. It's an hour it's and a half. Hike, yeah. Yeah, you is. came down, right? I did. I did. Before we get into anything, let's give a big shout out to our marquee sponsor. That's Toyota of Hackensack. We don't trust anybody as police, but we do trust Toyota of Hackensack. So if you're looking for a car, go to toyotaofhackensack.com. Let them find you a car. We got to we gotta pay the bills around here, you know? I get it, brother. They, they found my father a car, too, oh, which, which, yeah, which is nice. Yeah, which yeah. is a good, which was a hard thing. Old, yeah. old, old school Italian? Yeah. yeah. That was it, it's wrapped in steel. <laughs> <laughs> he likes to hit things. Mm. I am such an admirer of the work that you're doing in street cop training that I'm very happy that your producer, Frankie, reached out and, and brought you in today um, because I think you're, you're taking one life as a young man and you're expounding upon it by providing much-needed training and information to our law officers. Thank you so much. I appreciate it, man. Thank you. What we say, it's, it's helping cops get home. That's right. That's all it is. We just want people to go home and see their families. Dennis, each week we take a question from our audience. This week's question comes from Cyrus the Virus. That's why. I, that's actually why I grabbed this one, because I love that movie. We've all learned from our mentors and our older vets when we got on the job as police. But inevitably, there is something that impressed you. So Cyrus says, what impressed you the most early on in your career? Dennis, you're our guest. I'm going to pass this one off to you. I don't know if I have a particular moment that I can remember on a whim like this, but... I remember when I first started learning about how people who were not the tough guys, were not pretending to be tough guys, uh, would communicate with folks. So I saw one side of where communication would be very rugged and rough and sound very overbearing and dictatorial. And then I saw how people worked or wanted to work with the men and women on the job who were more personable and friendly and how much more cooperation and success they had by being so polite and friendly when maybe everybody else wasn't being that way. And that's when I recognized that this is just a better way to do it. It doesn't look as tough or as cool, but this is definitely the better way to do it. So I don't know if there's anybody in particular. I can think of a lot of people in my head that I saw who displayed these behaviors. And that's a real superpower as a law enforcement officer. That's a good answer. Yeah, that's a real do. good answer. Mike, what do you think? Well, you know, <clears throat> back when I was back in my rookie days, you know, we were in a locker room, and I saw a guy drop his pants. <laughs> you got impressed? Yeah. Way to bring it right down there. <laughs> no, no, seriously. I, like you said, it's the way people project themselves. You know, you don't have to be a tough ass. You don't have to be like this real hard, rugged cop. It's all about communication. But to me, the, the thing that really impressed me when I was younger, you know, younger in my career, was the way people dressed, the way they kept their uniform. You that's, know, that's, you, a good, that's a good answer. It, it's command presence. You know, you show up with, with donut stains on your shirt or your shirt hanging out, you're not going to get that respect. You see someone that's squared away, you know, 
fit uniform. I mean, I had every one of my uniforms tailored to fit. That's what I don't like about those new BDUs. That, and I understand it's more comfortable for the cops. I get that. But there was something about an officer who got out of their car, crisp, clean lines, you know, every, shoes shine. You look good because it, it's half the battle how you look. You know, the outer vests make everybody look heavy now. Yeah, that's you true, know? too. When you showed up to a I, scene, listen, I, I'm going to disagree because when you're a jacked up dude and you show up in an outer car, you now look more. I mean, well, you look no, more for command it's, presence. It's more imposing. It's more imposing. But you see a guy walk up and he's got that fucking V going. That was my drill. My drill yeah. was that way. I mean, if he gained two pounds, you'd know it. Yeah. Because his uniform was tight. Mm-hmm. Like he, he I was, said, I, I loved I loved the outer vest because to me that's that's tactical. You know, and you got more room to put stuff and everything. But I think a nice crisp uniform, that's that's the thing the most that's why I got into law enforcement. So my like I, I said it years ago. My my uncle was a, a captain in Port Authority police. And he's the reason I got in law enforcement because he looked so jacked up in a uniform. Mm-hmm. I was like, that's what I want to be like. Yeah, it's cool. I got two two incidents. <laughs> first incident, it was the first time a supervisor uh, you know, you get accused of certain things when you pull a car over. You pulled me over for this reason. You pulled me over for that reason. And some of them are very derogatory. And most of them, at the end of the day, are to get out of whatever you pulled them over for. I had a supervisor very early on in my career sit, really chide the person and, and stand the person up and say, you apologize to this officer. That's not what he did. You, you got pulled over for A, B, and C, which is very clearly evident on your vehicle. And I remember the feeling that I had. I felt good. Okay, I felt like, okay, well, somebody's got my back. That same sergeant, that same sergeant, you know, you get on the job, you're brand new, and people call you kid. You don't know anything until you got five years on the job. And, and part of that is true. You don't want to hear that. I don't like the term rookie for that reason. He, what he said when somebody, somebody had said, oh, he's just a kid, he doesn't know anything, he goes, stop. He's brand new out of the academy. His knowledge of 2C is far superior to yours because it's fresh in his mind. He may not have the street experience, but that'll come. That'll come in time. And it's that, that sergeant who I'm still friends with today, he's been retired for 20 years. I'm still friends with him to this day. I respect him because he really he instilled me with a lot of confidence. And as a new officer, that's, you can show confidence, but you don't have confidence yet. That not that that willingness to admit that he has more knowledge than I have, being a twenty year veteran in book law, you know, experience is a little bit different thing. Cyrus, Kev, do, do you think though, when people say you only pulled me over to this for this or for that, do you think that's them trying to get you off your game? I think it's being fed information. Yeah, I really do. I think it's being fed information, and it's an excuse to to try to get out of something, get you on your heels a little bit, yeah, get you off your game. Yeah, so yeah. I. Sometimes, sometimes it is true. Unfortunately, sometimes it, it does works. happen. Sometimes it works. Some, and a lot of times it works, <laughs> especially this day and age. <laughs> Cyrus, thank you so much for sending that one in. Keep sending in your questions. We will try to get them on the air. So, Dennis, you know, listen, I've done, I've done my research about you. You run this, this large company that's doing great things for law enforcement. You're a retired law enforcement officer, and you chose to stay in the field. Why don't you tell the audience a little bit about yourself? I'm a Jersey boy. I've always been a Jersey boy. Um, wanted to be a cop, I think, since the as far back as I can remember, even though that my actions in high school and middle school and, <laughs> Most and elementary are. school probably didn't reflect the fact that I had an intention to go into law enforcement. Well, I, I always said the best cops are the, are the street smart cops. There's no question the, about the it. The guys that, you know, you have the, the fine line between good and bad, and, they, and the good cops kind of straddle that line a little bit. Well, let me ask you this. Being retired, how long have you been retired? Eight years. Eight years. Okay. Seven years, three months, and twelve and 14, thirteen days. <laughs> I'm coming up on almost nine years straight. Um, now, in your travels outside of law enforcement, I'm sure you've met a lot of ex criminals, guys like, who have done some time, some serious sure, time. Of course. Okay. I mean, I worked in jail to start. Okay. How many of those guys who are ex criminals, retired criminals, are you friendly with? I don't know any of them. No, you don't. See, with Mike and I. We found that those those guys who have retired from their profession that we used to go against, we have so much in common yeah. with them because our our mindsets and our personalities are very similar. We just went in two different paths. That's right. But they're all type A personalities. They all have they're all strong willed. They all want to do what they want to do to the best of their ability. It's just they we separated somewhere. What do you usually say? Like the differences in us bring us closer together, or? There's more that brings us together than separates us. Yeah. It's kind of like I always I always equate it to uh, whenever they used to have the Gettysburg reunions, the old Civil War vets from both sides used to meet at Gettysburg, and they'd have 
a reunion, even both sides, and they shake hands, this is where we fought, you're retired soldiers of the battlefield, and you return to bring it back home. So it makes perfect sense that you towed that line in high school. Did you ever get in popped. trouble for any of those? Yeah, popped. popped, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> the statute of limitations is over, so we can talk. Uh, about yeah, I don't know. <laughs> we did a podcast with a friend of mine recently, and we talked about a lot of shit, and he called me, like, the next day, and he's he's a very well-known person. And uh, he's like, hey, um, we got to cut some of that stuff out. He's like, we're thinking about it. And I'm like, no, I, I agree. If, you, if you're not comfortable with it, that's fine. Yeah. But uh, – we're just trying to correlate business back to who we were and how innovative we were as kids and savvy in business or similar businesses uh, that procure revenue, um, albeit some of them probably not super legal, what, maybe what they, not highly illegal. It's what they call theft today. <laughs> yeah, but you know what? It's it's when you do something that's skirting that line, it's an adrenaline rush. Yeah, I, I think that we were just creative and we were lower middle class kids who wanted to learn how to make a buck. You know, who in a lower class middle – I'm sorry, lower middle middle class neighborhood is going to put their arm around you and teach you about business when everybody that that lives there is a factory worker, right? So, like, when you think about that, we were seeking more but had no guidance. Mm. So we did what we thought we were supposed to do. There was no internet. There was a time you had to to pay for pornography. People don't realize that. (laughs) It's disgusting. You had to actually go buy the videos in the store. Well, let me me just explain that process (laughs) for the young people who don't know what that was like. So, yes, you had to go to a store, usually a convenience <laughs> store. And there was a section of the convenience store that was – The kids weren't allowed in. Well, there was – a yeah, so it was behind maybe a small wall. Uh, but if you went back there, you could still see the top of your head typically. So, first of all, you had to make sure that the store was completely empty, especially if it was close <laughs> to your house. Then you had just seconds to go back there, and you had about – Maybe five genres to pick from. <laughs> so you had one, not like 7,000 today. Where you it wasn't just, these fetishes. No. You, know, you could think things up and just type it in. You'll find something on it. Now it's just, it was five straight up. This is this, 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 this. Playboy, Hustler, Penthouse. Yeah. Well, what's even talking about videos? I mean, there's certain, there was only certain things. I mean, um, I don't want to go too graphic here, but that's it. You know, you had to, you had, you had five genres to choose from. And if you thought that was the most embarrassing part, then you had to bring the DVD or VHS tape up to the counter to typically a New Jersey and Indian dude who would look at the thing and go, oh, big, oh. big tits. Huh? <laughs> right? Lesbians. Huh? Me too. I like this. Right? And you're just like, God, dude, just put it in the fucking oh. brown bag. Or if you have ventured. I saw this video last night. Very good. Yeah, just Very like. Good. If you ever ve- had the courage to venture into one of those cinder block buildings. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, I did too. <laughs> yeah. No that was that took some courage. And like, yeah, they show you. We got some booths in the back. It's like, yeah, I get it. Yeah, yeah well, I, you know, I mean, I. <laughs> yes, uh, at some point when I was 18, that was the only options, folks. Yeah. This wasn't some kind of thing, and I was worried about going into those places. Yeah, <laughs> you, you take your life into your hand. But th- there was always that odd person. <laughs> Just like in every – even today, if you go into a convenience store that has one of those sections with the magazines, there's always some random creepy guy hanging he's, around that section. He's lurking about. Yeah. You want to hear something crazy? I went uh, – maybe a while back, my wife and I went to a uh, adult variety store at night goofing off. And so we walk in, and she knows the girl who work, who's working behind the counter. It's a nice one. It's down South Jersey. It's nicer. It's not as bad as you think it is. And uh, it, wasn't, it was actually a pretty nice store. It wasn't some, like, sleazeball place. Um, and so she's talking to her. She's like, oh, are you the cop? And I'm like, yeah, yeah. She's like, where do you work? I'm like, next town over. You know, I'm over here. She's like, oh, that's cool. At the same time, this dude is in there shoplifting expensive vibrators, like ones that are, like, $250, $300 a piece. And she's like – He's a cop. He's going to arrest you. And I'm like, oh, my God. Could you imagine this, what I'm going to have to do? She knows I'm a cop. If this dude starts getting crazy in here, I got to do something, right? I got a pistol on me. And and I'm going to have to try to explain to my agency why I apprehended somebody while shopping in a adult variety store. What? That's what? called creative why? writing. Why? Well, it's not even creative writing. She's like, could you imagine this story? Like, yeah, what did Benito get into today? <laughs> I locked somebody up off duty shoplifting vibrators I, I think the scarier thing is you walked into a sex shop with your wife and the girl the first time you walk into a sex shop with your wife and the girl hey, they went to high school counter. together Mike they went to high school together a, 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 knows your wife a suspicious oh, you're, back, you're back again here's how that here's how that report would go so, so witness a suspicious male walking into a re, into a commercial building <laughs> yeah he made an assertive movement <laughs> yeah which is always the go to he made an assertive movement and I enacted an arrest and i saw a big black thing hanging out of his hands i thought it was a gun but so when you were a brand new officer how long did you always carry an off duty i mean as soon as i can carry i mean i got the job when i was 19 right so uh the minute i got 
the permission to carry an off-duty weapon is the very second that I carried an off-duty weapon. And did that continue? I have a gun on me now. Oh, okay. Well, that's that's comforting. Okay. Yeah. Um, sorry, sorry if I offended. That was all. that was the one thing. <laughs> I'm not a gun guy. I just, for me, uh, I would hate to be put in the predicament of having the ability to intervene and stop something very significant from happening. And dude, it'd have to be a pretty high threshold for me to get involved. I'm not getting involved on some stupid shit. Uh, basically, active shooter or some kind of significant loss of life is imminent and going to happen. I would hate to have the ability or the authority to still be able to carry a pistol and not and find myself in a situation like that and not be prepared to have at least done something. Because if your kids are in there, I see them as my kids. Yeah. I always no say I'd rather be caught with it than without it. Yeah, I mean, I again, I'm not somebody who is looking to get involved in anything. Uh, I even had the thought on the way up. I'm like, oh, I got to get my gun. I mean, like, if somebody comes out here, I'm in traffic on the parkway, right, and like wants my car, I'm probably going to give them the car. Mm. You know, yeah. I mean, I'm just not. I don't know if I'm going to shoot somebody over the car. I just don't know if I want to even deal with those headaches of yeah. shooting somebody with over the car. Especially what you do now, you see, oh, you know, I, you you hear the the horror stories all around. Yeah. But now, growing up, what 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 drew you to law enforcement? <clears throat> You know, I, I think that it comes down to probably some deep psychological stuff. I hate fucking bullies. They make me insane. Uh, my father was a very, very big bully. Do you know Jay Aponte? Yeah. <laughs> I, was, I actually, so it, it's, a, it's a story of healing because I bullied a kid in seventh and eighth grade, felt bad. He left eighth, after eighth grade, felt bad about it my entire life. 30 years, I hunted him down to apologize. Yeah. Finally found him. Yeah. And it was cathartic i bet it was it was awesome and here's the sad part guy's a cop oh I, shit the guy's a cop in new york i lost a friend that i could have had a really good friend for 30 years and him and i are we're pretty tight now for that reason like you know he's i consider him one of my oldest friends mm -hmm. even though i treated him like shit but yeah. i treated him like shit for different reasons because uh, there was something wrong with me There's correct wrong with him um but that's that's an honorable reason to get involved in law enforcement because you want to stop bullies. You want to take care of people who may not have the ability to take care of themselves. That's exactly everything about it, dude. Yeah. And now once you got you God, nineteen, getting a pension system on nineteen, that's a beautiful thing. Well, don't forget, I paid a lot of dues up front. I was going to police academy at four thirty in the morning when all my friends are coming back from Rutgers, yeah. shit face, talking about hooking up with chicks. And I'm but my head shaved 20 miles from here running uh, Camp Gore Road in Bergen County, New Jersey. Bergen County, Bergen County, Bergen County 5.30 in the morning, freezing my ass off at 19, you know? Um, so I couldn't even drink. Yeah, but in a lot of ways, those kids coming back from Rutgers may be a little uh, shiftless with where their direction of their, their career is going, and you had a direction. For sure. Listen, I, I have no beef with it or qualms, just that the early entry – also came with a lot of sacrifice. Uh, I mean, dude, I I started off in corrections, all right, that they gave me a job when I was 19. I left there in about two years. And, um, I mean, I was working New Year's Eve on double shifts, stuck in the jail. I was dealing with horrible, horrible people constantly. I ran a nice housing unit. You know, I ran, a, I, I, I learned a lot very quickly. But, um, you know, I, I did miss a lot for the back end ability to leave early. So you, you, there was... There were dues. I did pay dues. Like my friend of mine's a very successful realtor. You will see his signs all throughout New Jersey. Rob sells New Jersey. What you don't know is Rob punted 18 to 31. All he did was work Easter, Christmas. The guy never stopped. That's why he's the most successful realtor in New Jersey. People say, oh, he's so lucky. Lucky. He missed 13 years of his life, and he missed a lot of those experiences, which he's learning about in his 30s into 40s, the things that we learn in our 20s about relationships and dating. He just never did it because he was so consumed with being successful. So there was, there was a trade-off. Because people see the finish line. They don't mm. see the training going up to the marathon that you just ran. You know, they don't see those days of sacrifice waking up 4.30 in the morning, you know, not being able to go. Three academies. Yeah, well, it, you know, it's the same thing with, like, bodybuilding. They see people in these, in these shows, and they're, they're yeah. huge. They don't see the build-up to that. No, they don't. And, you know, when you, if you're lucky enough to get on so early and you retire – Everybody's like, wow, you retired early. That's great. That's wonderful. Yeah, well, now I got to make up for the time that I lost. Time lost. A kid. So that, that was good and bad to it. I mean, I'm not, I'm not complaining. It's, it was my path. I have no beef with it at all. I'm glad that I took the path that I did. I couldn't figure out my third academy why I was in another academy. And <laughs> like in four and a half years, I was like, why? Well, why, th why three? I left, went federal, and then came back. Oh. And they wouldn't waive me. And so I could you, be waived. So you did the CO Academy? 
I went to Bergen for 17 weeks. Yeah. I went to Fletzy for uh, oh, basically six months, uh, Federal Law Enforcement Training Center. And then I came back uh, 20 months later and went through uh, Somerset here. And that was the worst academy of them all. And I could not believe that for my third one, I was going to the worst academy in the state. Why, why wouldn't he wave you at all? Uh, because they don't give a fuck. Yeah, exactly. It's not their money. They don't run places like their businesses. They don't give a shit about me. <clears throat> And it's easier. And, and their excuse was, "Well, if we need your training records, we don't want to have to call down to uh, to Washington D.C. to get them. We just can call over to Somerset, and they'll give us your stuff." Yeah. Which what, is a big crock of shit. They, they used Absolutely. to do that with OC spray. Like they, they, our, our department used to spray us every year. When you get OC sprayed once, you're you're certified. You're certified. And they would say, "Well, just in by case. the way, you don't need to be sprayed with OC to be certified. You uh, never no, have you to be. No, never. No. You don't. Nope. You don't. No, no, I didn't know that. It's for testimony. No it's kidding. not even for testimony. I think it's for experience because in yeah. Bergen, they don't get sprayed. They don't spray them in Bergen. Well, Which at least I, they didn't in 01 no, when I went. I, I, I never got sprayed in the academy either. Now, I, 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 got, I got sprayed when I became an OC instructor. I got sprayed every year. Yeah. And with somebody with a skin tone like me, what that stuff did to me, it used to burn the hell out of me. And, and I would I try to tell these guys, we don't need to do this every year. Why are we doing this? But well, see, we because I'm a moron. No, see, I was an OC instructor. The reason they spray you every year is because shits and giggles. Oh, yeah, that's it, it dude. <laughs> it's pretty funny. There's the, listen, it's like, it's like, you know, you're in the academy, you're learning about the hydraulic needle effect. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Guess what? Nobody on earth has or is going to testify on the hydraulic needling effect. Hydraulic needle effect is when you get sprayed right Too close, directly yeah. into, the into your cornea and it yeah. damages your cornea. Mm -hmm. Like, who the fuck, who is going to testify on the ulnar bone <laughs> and where the handcuff goes? I've never heard of such a thing.